Life is a beautiful bummer. The way of all natural things is to begin, to live, to grow and bloom, to wither and fade, to die, and then to begin again. Whether you believe in an afterlife or reincarnation, death is not the end. It is a transformation into a new beginning. The ancient Greeks could see the patterns of life, death, and rebirth all around them, especially in the seasons. Agriculture was the life force that allowed great civilizations to rise and a bountiful harvest was imperative to their survival. But how did the Greeks explain the way their lands grew barren in the winter, only to be revived with new, fruitful life every spring? Like all things, they had a myth for that. And it goes a little like this. At some point in the long and incestuous history of the Greek gods, Zeus, the king of the Olympians, and Demeter, the goddess of the harvest and agriculture, had an affair that resulted in a beautiful baby girl. Her name was Persephone. Persephone was a goddess of life and a maiden of springtime. Like her mother, she was associated with the divine element of making things grow. If her looks weren't alluring enough, the warmth of her gentle Demeter made her radiant. She was beloved by all who knew her. Demeter cherished her daughter more than anything in the world and treated her as she would the most tender new buds of spring. She felt compelled to protect her daughter from the darkness of the world, and to that end, she kept the young woman a little too much in the dark. Still dressed as a child long after she had grown, Persephone was incredibly naive. One day, Persephone and Demeter were picking flowers in the Vale of Nysa. With a basket filled with lilies and violets, Persephone wandered off, deeper, into a secluded wood, where she spotted the soft white petals of a narcissus flower. As she reached down to collect it, the earth beneath her split open, ripping the forest ground apart and tearing the flower from its roots. Hades, the god of the underworld, emerged through the rift in the earth, riding his dark chariot pulled by black horses. As he came at her, Persephone screamed for her mother's rescue, but it was too late. She had wandered too far off for Demeter to even hear her calling. Hades grabbed her and dragged her back into the underworld. The tear in the ground closed neatly behind him, leaving no trace of her kidnapping. Hades was lonely down in the underworld. Some myths have written him as evil, while others say by the nature of his deathly domain, he was feared. Hades was forced to be reclusive and prone to gloom that was misunderstood. But one day, he looked to the world above him and saw Persephone playing with a group of nymphs. She was luminous in a way that melted his heart, which had grown cold as a corpse over the years. He was instantly besotted. By some accounts, Hades first went to Zeus to ask for Persephone's hand in marriage, and Zeus agreed to it wholeheartedly. However, Hades knew Demeter would never consent to the marriage, which is why he stole Persephone away. Demeter was devastated by her daughter's disappearance. She searched every land known to man for nine days. On the tenth day, Hecate, the goddess of the mystical and the moon, came to Demeter to claim she had heard Persephone's cries, but she had not seen what happened. They went to Helios, god of the sun, to see if he had witnessed anything from his chariot in the sky. Not only had he seen it, he also knew of the agreement between Hades and Zeus. When he told Demeter of her daughter's fate, she was livid, but also resigned. If Zeus had given his permission and aided in the abduction of his own daughter, there was little she could do. Shattered and unmoored, Demeter disguised herself as an old woman, wandering aimlessly around the earth, telling those who asked that she had escaped captivity by dangerous pirates. As she entered the kingdom of Eleusis, the city's four mortal princesses found her, and taking pity on her old form and her tale of woe, brought the veiled goddess back to their palace. There she met the queen, who had recently given birth to a sweet baby prince. Cradling his tiny form, Demeter felt the first ounce of satisfaction since her daughter was stolen from her. The royal family agreed that the old woman was so good with the baby, she should remain as his nurse. Demeter came to love the prince so much, she couldn't bear the thought of his mortality. She could not lose another child to the god of death, so she decided to give him immortality through a rite of her own devising. Every night, she poured a magical elixir on him and held him in a fire. And every day, the prince's beauty and strength grew. He even began to take on a godly glow. The queen was unnerved by her baby's sudden change and decided to watch the old woman more carefully. That night, she crept into the nursery and saw the prince being held in the fire. Terrified, she tore him from the old woman's hands and cursed her for endangering the child. Demeter was once again enraged and finally revealed her true form. The goddess told the doomed queen that by pulling her son from the fire, she had ensured his inevitable death. He could now never be an immortal. The royal family had much to atone for. 
They built Demeter a massive temple devoted to her worship, but it might as well have been a tomb for her to wallow in. Demeter lived in it like a ghost, grieving the loss of her daughter. Her sadness was so intense, crops shriveled in the field and nothing could grow. Around the world, humans and animals began to starve. The gods pleaded with Demeter to have mercy, but the goddess insisted not a single grain would grow until her daughter was returned to her. Zeus finally began to worry about the consequences of his conspiracy with Hades. If all the humans were to starve and die, who would revere the gods with gifts and offerings? He brought his son Hermes to him. He had a message to deliver to Hades in the underworld. Persephone must be brought back to Demeter. The fate of the human world depended on it. In this version of a hunger strike, everyone would go hungry because of Demeter's protest. Meanwhile, in the underworld, Persephone was having a hard time adjusting to married life in her new home. She too was on a kind of hunger strike, too forlorn to eat anything since her arrival. Hades was generous, kind, and loving. Some even say that he created Elysium specifically for Persephone as a beautiful haven for her to roam in the underworld that only the most deserving souls could enter. He treated his queen as his partner and his equal, not that she sat on a throne beside him, but it did not completely make up for the non-consensual nature of their match. She desperately missed her mother and the freedom she had enjoyed as a carefree girl in the world above. Hermes arrived swiftly in the underworld by way of his winged sandals. He shared the command that Persephone be free to return to her mother, leaving Hades devastated. He asked for a moment alone with his wife so he could plead for her to stay with the same tenderness he had treated her since she became queen. Persephone was torn. Something had developed between them that was at least akin to love, friendship, respect, a sense of pleasure she had found in his company. But the call of sunshine and her mother's love was too strong. Despite her feelings for him, she told him she would still rather return. Hades sighed. Seemingly defeated, he prepared to let his wife go. But before she returned, he had just one more request of her. He placed a deep red pomegranate seed in her palm and asked that she eat it before she departed. He told her that it was the fruit of the underworld and that consuming it would bring her luck. Trusting the god she had come to respect as her husband, Persephone put the tiny seed in her mouth and swallowed. In some versions of the story, this was the first and last thing Persephone had eaten during her whole stay in the underworld. She then bid Hades goodbye, and she and Hermes returned to the human world in his dark chariot, breaking through the Earth's crust to reappear as quickly as she had departed. The reunion between Demeter and Persephone was a joyous one. Persephone told her mother that in the end, Hades wasn't so bad. She hadn't minded being married to him, except for missing her mother and the feeling of the sun on her skin. She also told her mother of the strange request Hades had made of her before she left. When her mother heard that her daughter had eaten the pomegranate seed, she wailed in anguish and defeat once again. Persephone was startled at her mother's response. She had no idea what she had done, what Hades had done to her once again without her consent. Demeter explained that because she had eaten the fruit of the underworld, she was now obliged to return to Hades, or at least she must return for half of the year. In some versions of the story, Persephone had eaten six pomegranate seeds, which determined the number of months she must rejoin her husband as his immortal queen. Persephone got six warm, beautiful months with her mother, but in the months she went back to her husband, Demeter became inconsolable again. It was the first true winter the world had ever seen. From there on out, the seasons were ruled by Demeter's moods. In the spring and summer, when Persephone was free to pick wildflowers and roam the forest with her mother, the crops of the world grew hardy and lush. In the fall and winter, as Demeter lost her daughter again, that growth would halt. Barrenness and coldness fell upon the human world. Six months, pining for the warmth and light of the next spring. Surprisingly, modern interpretations of Persephone's abduction perpetuate a much more sympathetic narrative towards Hades than the original story had seemingly intended. If we look to the first written account of this legend, written by Ovid's Metamorphosis, he describes Persephone as terrified in tears and as a girl frightened and forced. The myth's themes perpetuate what might be some of the earliest examples of opposites attracting, tales that justify relationships between people who seem wholly incompatible, and yet, the power of their love can overcome any difference or obstacle. The story also explicitly lends itself to the trope of the romance between a beauty and a beast, which would be repeated throughout history in many iterations. Regardless of how or why, we know history was rewritten to romanticize the relationship between Hades and Persephone, rather than acknowledge the horrors of her trafficking, rape, and involuntary marriage. We also know history has endlessly perpetuated these crimes against women with as much certainty as the change of the seasons. Even today, Persephone's mythological experience is a cruel reality many women still face. So this is the version of her story we will tell and never forget.